Good morning, everybody. Um, as usual, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the 2022 Ashtekar Frontiers of Science Lectures presented by the Everly College of Science. I'm Miguel Mostafa. I'm the Associate Dean for Research and Innovation in the college. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here and welcome you today, uh, second to last uh, of these lectures. Um, the lecture series uh, was founded by Professor Abai Ashtekar, who is the founding director of the Institute for Gravitation and the Cosmos and a member of the National Academy of Science. The series also owes its success to Barbara Kennedy, who presided over it during the first 25 years, making it one of the most successful science outreach events in Pennsylvania. Today's lecture is presented by Dr. Jin Zhao Zhu. Dr. Zhu is the Vern M. Willeman Professor of Mathematics and the Director of the Center for Computational Mathematics and Applications at Penn State. His main research interests are in the study of numerical methods, especially multi-level and adapted finite element methods for systems of partial differential equations and their applications. His other research interests include analysis, modeling, and applications of deep neural networks. He's known, for example, for the bramble pasiak zhu preconditioner as one of the two basic multigrid methods for numerical partial differential equations, and also for the hipmeyer zhu preconditioner featured in the 2008 by the DOE, the Department of Energy, as one of the top 10 breakthroughs in computational science in recent years. He was invited speaker at the International Congress for Industrial and Applied Mathematics in 2007, as well as the International Congress for Mathematicians in 2010. He's a fellow of the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics and the American Mathematical Society and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And Without further ado, I leave you with Dr. Shu. And remember that you can start typing your questions in the questions and answer uh, tab or in the chat if you don't find that. And, and we'll go over the questions at the end of the talk. Dr. Shu, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your kind introduction. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to talk uh, about uh, mathematics uh, of deep learning uh, today. And uh, let see, I, so I usually, you know, begin with, uh, you know, uh, when we started research here, we have uh, theoretical science, computational science, and, uh, and uh, experimental science. Now these days we call it data science. And uh, today we're talking about data science. And uh, one big success uh, in data science is the deep learning, which uh, is one of the focus in this uh, sequence of lecture this, this semester. And uh, so actually when I talked about data science in general, actually deep learning specifically to my colleagues, especially my mathematical colleagues, they were asking questions that is the data science actually a science or deep learning? Uh, it's a science, and uh, um, it has been often said that deep learning is like alchemy, and not much of analytics, and uh, people just uh, tune parameters and try things. And then the question is, can we actually have some mathematics uh, understanding of this uh, very advanced this technology? And I'm just trying to try my best to to offer my view of how we understand this mathematics. And, uh, you know, again, uh, uh, I know it understands the general audience and, uh, and um, I'm trying to be offer some uh, elementary introduction. Hopefully at the end, I'll bring up some advanced topics. And uh, first of all, we'll ask ourselves, what is intelligence? Uh, you would probably look up on the Google, uh, you know, maybe I say ability to learn, understand, and uh, make judgment. We have a, our brain, and uh, we talk, you know, intelligence, what I would call the natural intelligence, human intelligence, which exists in nature, created by God. 
So artificial intelligence is designed and made by, by, by people, and maybe some people call it machine intelligence. This, um, I call this a machine brain, or it's like a neural network we're gonna talk about today. Let's give me some examples. Let's say in our life, one of the talking intelligence, we make decisions. We, you know, we make decision all the time, <laughs> yes or no. You do, and mathematically, I introduced this something called a, what an activation function. If some uh, threshold number is greater than zero, okay, I say yes. Otherwise, I say no. That's the quantification of the yes or no. And let's just say we we give ex experience. I, I'm going to hire people. We say, suppose you have a certain job. You have three more than three years experiences. I hire you. Otherwise, I won't hire you. Very simple as a criteria. And then this is a very simple neural network. And they basically, if X is greater than three, okay, yes. Less or equal to three, no. So that's mathematically represented as H X minus three. This is a, what we call an activation function. It's a heavy side function. This is the simplest example. Yes. So suppose I say, I'm going to have a, not only experience, but also education. And in this case, uh, we're going to do a little bit more complicated. Well, you can take a linear combination of it. So you, you kind of given a, make a decision based on the score. And uh, if you feel why you call the one, yes. And uh, so now, so again, uh, so I have, instead of one, one factors, I have two facts. Uh, experience and education, okay, depend on where you come from. Do you think ed education is more important than experience or not? I, in this case, I say education is more important. Say so W2 equal to two, W1 equal to one. So I, I, I create a neural network to decide. And uh, let's say I send some candidates. First candidate, maybe have three years experience, I got a PhD. And uh, so say I get a score of six, I say yes. And I get a master, I say yes, okay. But I, but I, okay, suppose that you have a bachelor, master student, but you only got a one year experience. So I, you know, based on this kind of decision making process is actually no. So it depends on uh, how you view the, this is, you know, the, the qualification, the importance that you put certain ways and the bios and uh, to make the decision. And uh, uh, so here we have uh, actuation function usually in the very beginning of machine learning, we, we use a heavy side function. But one of the things is not, is this kind of disc, discontinuous function? You have the jump at the zero, but uh, this, the, one of the most, uh, commonly used the most popular activation function called a ReLU, rectified linear unit. The, this is the function is that when x is greater or equal to zero, I pick the x, but x is less or equal to zero, it's a zero. So I have a quantity when x, not only yes or no, but with a quantity. So I say, for example, you hire somebody, okay, I'm not only decide going to hire the person, but I also give the salary, let's say. So if y is greater than zero, so, so, we, so then I also not only, okay, I'll hire it, but I also give a salary. Suppose uh, I type put the weight W1 is $2,000. So you write this uh, neural network. So you, what you do is that you, you take a different candidate and then not only you decide to, to hire the people, you also actually come up with a salary. So we need a little bit more, 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 you know, a little bit complicated formula to make the decision. And uh, this one actually use, a, a, this is a, a, a new, a, a, what I call ReLU uh, neural network uh, activation functions. And uh, so again, this is usually the computer scientists like to draw a, a plot like this. You have the years, degrees, then you go put some ways, you take the ReLU, you take another layer, uh, so you get this, this, this decision kind of making the output. This is called input, this is output. And uh, I, so suppose, uh, you know, in, in, this is just in, in real life, you have a lot of things to consider. Suppose you consider years experience, maybe working years, uh, management experience, maybe what kind of degree you get, maybe which school you go, maybe, you know, the university ranking may be important, maybe, you know, the, the GPA 
for example. So that's the input. Maybe in this case, you have five parameters and the five inputs variables, and uh, you, you, it's a vector of, uh, you know, of length five. So, uh, so experience, uh, you know, you put certain weight as we did earlier, but this also may be related to the degree of the things, maybe there's different also weight. And then now you're talking about the education, you also put the weight. And uh, so you introduce this X1, which you have a two component. And uh, you have the X11, X21, and they have this weight. But uh, this is uh, maybe the, the uh, uh, based on the maybe human resource people, when you hire people, you put some weights in there. But uh, so then you decide. So you, you you put the score. So after that, you can uh, put this Y to maybe it's the salary. So you want to hire people based on this thing. This is a very oversimplified model. Again, it gives you an idea. Using renew neural network function, it is possible to, de to, to devise such a procedure to do the hiring process. This, this is actually, we call it deep neural network. The deep means the number of layers more than one. And the deep neural network, uh, usually when you see machine learning literature, you have all this, uh, you have the input layer, hidden layers, output layers, and all that. And uh, in the previous example, we had this uh, one hidden layer, there's like three layers, there's two hidden layer, and all that. But in general, you may have a lot of layers to talk about. When the more layer, you call it deeper. That's where the word deep come from. So you have a lot of layer, neural network. And uh, uh, now the question that, uh, okay, I, I say that based, maybe you, you choose based on your, how do you actually determine this, uh, this weight? And uh, you're talking about the human resource people, maybe it uses their hiring experience. For example, I take a W1, two, you could uh, greater than one. That means maybe you believe education is more important than experience. And, but, uh, but the machine learning is that, uh, we're supposed to don't take your subjective kind of opinions away using data. So you, somehow you develop a kind of a neural network system we're going to learn from the data. So what, what, how does that work? Suppose, uh, you know, you just have to based on your, your hire, your, the people you already hired <clears throat> based on the criteria you had before. So you take the, the employees, say maybe end of the, of the employees, and they will say experience and education are the parameters. So after a certain time, you give an evaluation of your, your, your employee, bad, fair, good, very good, excellent. So it's kind of a classification problem. So the model is that I wrote it before. This time I do not uh, assign the ways, but I'm going to, I'm going to find the way such that uh, the outcome will, will fit the actual evaluation from the people you, you hire. It's called a labor. It's a why, why. So, and uh, so you want to find the parameter to fit the actual data as close as possible. So you just want to find the theta this way such that uh, you know, the outcome uh, is close to that. Usually you can think about the least square to do it. So you want to make this, uh, this what we call loss function as small as possible. So you find the minimizer of it. So that would be the, the decision parameter, which is kind of learned from the data you had. So if you have a new person, suppose you have enough experiences, so now you put this, uh, you know, the, the parameters, the, the input data there. So you figure out what, you know, this, uh, which class it belongs to. If it's something excellent, you should definitely hire the guy. So that's a, 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 a simple uh, machine learning kind of example. It's actually deep learning examples. And it consists of the model, the training data, all, all the components of the machine learning process. So the finding this uh, minimization problem is called a training algorithm. So imagine yourself, uh, the landscape of loss function is a mountain here. You see this dot in the view is, uh, is the global minimizer. So of course you're starting from here, this person. So when you wanna go down here, you, you can only see locally. You know, this is the problem here. We're solving a highly long convex problems. You wanna see a locally, so you would, uh, 
go the direction which is uh, locally, which is uh, decrease the fastest. For any, anybody who started the multivariable calculus, locally, the fastest de decay direction is the negative gradient direction. So you, you take the theta t is the current step is where you, you, you sit, where you, you stand. And the, you take a eta t kind of step size. If you the step size is too much, you'll go uphill there. So you have to take the right size so that it can go down the hill. So this is what is called gradient descent method. And uh, it's still the, the, the most commonly used, uh, uh, some variants like stochastic gradient descent method is still the method to be used in practice these days. I'll come back to that later a little bit. So, uh, so it's like, uh, you know, it's like the, all the species, uh, we have a different uh, level of capacity brains. I don't know, do you, would you believe the bird has any, any brains or not, or they can think? But I, say, I just recently watched uh, the movie War, War Horse. This, uh, war, this horse in the movie seems to have, can communicate with humans. You have, you have a certain brains, you have certain intelligence. And uh, now we want to do the, 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 the machine kind of learning kind of model. The things that in statistics use a lot, for example, linear regression, linear model, and a little bit more sophisticated, maybe so support the vector machine. And uh, this stays the state of the art, the, the most you know, efficient one that people consider is a deep neural network model, which I, uh, uh, you know, use that the examples of hiring to explain that. So the uh, so now <clears throat> actually this neural networker is being said in 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 the de development of the neural network. Actually, it's mimicked from the natural brain. And uh, you, let me just put these things together. <laughs> Uh, and uh, you would argue that uh, you, you have some information comes in, which uh, from the signal X, so the then try the, will we'll receive the signal and uh, this we will be processed in the cell body. You now there's some kind of activation you know, in the brain to make some decision, you go to the next layer. The next layer you carry through to the, the next one you want. So you just repeat. So you have, uh, I don't know, they have layers of uh, lots of neurons, you know, a brain and different layers. And it's been uh, said that uh, the artificial neural network, it is actually trying to mimic the, the structure of the brain. But of course, our, the understanding of our brain is still limited by that. But remarkably, such a uh, process of trying to mimic this uh, human brain brings this remarkable deep neural, neural net, deep learning technology, which is quite uh, efficient. So now let's see how we're gonna learn the things. How we, you know, you have this uh, neural network, right? You want to learn, you want to train. Now suppose uh, the natural training, I suppose uh, we teach our kid. So how do you tell the difference between uh, cat and dog and the rabbit? So we just tell our kids. Okay, this is a cat, this is a dog. So you, you somehow you, you, you know, so if, they, if the kid is seeing enough, next time they see something, he will make the decision. So the left side is the training, the right side is the testing. You know, it, it, you know it's the application of your, your things. So somehow our brain is kind of trained by, by the, the data. And uh, but if you, you just replace this by, by a neural network, the neural network will take a function. Suppose I put label one zero zero according to the cat. The uh, the dog is zero one zero, and uh, well, a rabbit is a zero zero one. But sometimes you may not be able to tell. Wow, I probably get an eighty percent of a chance this is a dog, not a cat, because these days uh, these cute animals you cannot really tell the difference. But I. So there's a, the labeling could be a probability distribution, but in any case, when it, after you have trained your neural network, suppose you have seen enough, so next time when, when, when you have this output, you say 0 0.7, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 is the probability distribution, you get, okay, you got a 70% of chance, this is a cat, so that will be cat. So you just look at the, log, the maximal component, which give you the certain 
this model would predict you, that would be, you got 80% is a dog, maybe 90% or 60% is a rabbit. And this is how this system works. This, this is how they basically roughly the, uh, the, the, the neural network is working. And uh, but I just want to say that um, this is about pure data. My favorite example is that um, a native language, and uh, I say that the native language we teach our kids is by purely by data. You just, uh, you know, the, our kids uh, mimic uh, how, what the parents say, their siblings say that. And in this case, you will take some time and uh, you, would, uh, you know, will learn how to speak. But uh, most of us are uh, trying to learn the foreign language. Interesting enough, for me, my interpretation of for learning the foreign language uh, it's actually mostly learning by kind of a theory, using the rules. You know, remember I had the theory, experiments, uh, computation, and the data. If we learn the foreign language, we use the rule of pronunciation, syntax. If you, you know, you use this couple of weeks, you can pretty much speak a few, few sentences at least. And uh, you don't need a lifetime experience to speak a good language. And uh, but uh, that would be a kind of a foreign language it seems to be already kind of learned by theory in some sense. But the more efficient way to see that I would call a logic, data and the logic. So if you want the native language, you have to go to school to learn the more advanced, you know, linguistic, you know, grammar. And uh, for a foreign language, you you not only learn the grammars, but also you need to practice more. So this is a kind of what we call the uh, one new kind of method is learned by logics. Another type is by data experiments, uh, data science. And the, the way we, I, I, I just coined this term called the logistic based machine learning. I, I just made up that term. It's data plus logic. Logic, you have a theory, model, that kind of stuff. And if you put them together, that would be the right way to to learn. Actually, one of the, for those of you in the engineering application, one of the, the, the something called PIN is a physics informed the natural uh, neural network is, is, a, is, a, is a methodology it makes you use the data as well as the model, physical equations to, uh, to learn the, the, the to, 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 to do the, the, the modeling. It's a... So, uh, Again, uh, so I'm going to use the classification problem to talk about the, 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 the machine learning a little bit. The machine learning really is a very rich subject, and uh, 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 the kind of thing that we're going to talk about is a supervised learning, which I'm going to say some more. There's also some kind of unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning. And uh, so let me just talk about the supervised learning. So, supervised, for example, as I mentioned earlier, is supposed to you, how, what can you make this. Uh, machine this uh, brain to tell the difference of these three different species. So we, the way to do a supervised learning is that you, 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 you put some, uh, you, 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 you know, uh, um, you put some label of these images. Now the question is that, uh, uh, suppose you have every image you get, is like a, maybe you say you have 3 million pixels. Simply speaking, you can convert the three million pixel of this image into a point in the Euclidean space of three million dimensions. We are living in a three dimensional world. Suppose you go to three million dimensions. Now, now this is a matter of phase right now. The way you can uh, tell the difference between three different species is that they should be clustered in different places with a certain metric of uh, distance. And uh, if they intertwine to each other, there's no way, this it will be very difficult to, to classify them. So mathematically, you want to find a function to tell the difference. So a function with some kind of parameters and, um, and uh, let's say, so if I say the cat, you have certain pixel, vectors, you fit that one in, I'm going to make this guy to be one zero zero. I say, you know, the, the dog is zero one zero, the, the rabbit is zero zero one. Okay. Again, the next time when it comes, I have something which if I get to be 
uh, probably distributed in 0.7, 0.2, 0.1. So you say got a 70% of the chance this is a cat. This is how the mathematics works. Uh, this is a kind of uh, cartoon I had earlier. So you have a training, you have the test. Now the question is what kind of mathematics we should do in between? And uh, so the first, the, the first thing is that uh, is the linear models. And uh, in, uh, if you study statistics, well, they say you, you have uh, two sets, which you call the separable. You may, they say in two dimensional Euclidean space, you put some points. And every image we're talking about will be some point in the Euclidean space, or which is higher dimension. Now, how do you separate them? The most simple model, is uh, put a hyperplane in between. When you say that, uh, so this hyperplane can write as a linear function like that. So you, if it's greater than zero, I call it maybe the first class. If it's less than zero, I call it the second class. It's A1, A2, we call it linear and separable. Suppose, uh, uh, let's just hypothetically in the idealistic situation, you do have two sets of separable. How do you find the, the hyperplane that separate them? There's a, this is a numeric, this is a method which has been taught in, in the statistics, statistic is a logistical regression, for example. You want to somehow modify this uh, likelihood function. And uh, then you can also, uh, 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 you can also take the minimization of the negative log of them. And uh, so you find an optimization problems. You do the, but usually they get a regularization term in here. So there's a probabilistic kind of uh, interpretation of this. And I won't get into this because it's pretty standard in statistics. So the, the, the important thing is that this regularization in machine learning is the, really the, the one of the most important things. And here, for example, if you let the regularization parameter, you can think about the background the data is like Gaussian, uh, the parameter you have just, and the, and the, uh, you let the lambda go to zero, for example, this will call, call some kind of a support vector machine. And then you have two sets, you want a hyperplane, there's infinitely many hyperplane that are separate these two sets. So, so what is the best one? The support vector machine says, I put this in the middle. You know, then uh, you can probably this one would generalize well. You know, because your next time you have a data, you know, the the, the you would get a better prediction. And uh, mathematically, you can say uh, when this uh, uh, lambda goes to zero, regularize this uh, uh, this uh, this uh, logistic regression model. You can actually get a better and better generalization accuracy, and which is getting close to the support vector machine. And uh, I use this example saying that you can have a simple linear model, which is, uh, traditionally you have logistic regression support vector machine is the linear model, which is a very simple model to do the classification. But uh, in practice, uh, I can tell you this rabbit uh, dog and the cat that are not linear, uh, separable. So in this case, you need a long linear problem. You need a long linear model. So say, let's just say they are separable somehow, but, uh, but you need to find a long linear mapping, which I call a feature map, so that the image of the things will be become linear separable, or linear separable with high probability. And uh, <clears throat> So, so take this data for example in two dimension. As you can see, there's no way this red and the, and the blue when you can put a, a you know a line to separate them. The way to to do is actually a circle. That's actually a long linear functions. If you take this uh, circle fun long linear function, you map it to one D. As you can see, this is a perfectly linear separable data. The challenge here, the, the game we want to play in practice, so you want to find this long linear map such that to make your, your data to be as linearly separable as possible. And that's the whole game of machine learning models. So you know, basically you know that if you believe that this is a separable, which we are, we human being can tell the difference between cat and dog, 
So there's a, a nonlinear function sitting there. So how are you going to approximate that nonlinear function? And uh, I, so, for example, so you need this nonlinear function, and they, 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 in such a way that um, it kind of more or less separate them right. Yeah, this is a kind of an interesting uh, a, 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 a plot. One of the things that, uh, because of the data comes with a noise, uh, bio, you know, outliers and all that, you can you really should have a compromised kind of a long linear model so that, uh, um, you know, you, you, can, you know, for the training data, you, you, you cannot do too good. For example, for this particular case, if you really want to get this training data perfectly right, so this is what they call over feature. So uh, next time you put a new data is the blue one, which is uh, the, in the training region, this is fine, but, uh, but, uh, but that one is probably more or less in the circle region and it doesn't really generalize so well. So this is a regularization, the generalization, all these things are the most uh, critically important things in, in machine learning. And the question is that how we, okay. The idea is that if you think these things are separable, you can tell the difference. Then mathematically, there's a long linear function somehow that will do the job. So you want to find that long linear function. Now the question is how do you, uh, to, to now that you want to have a model, basically you want to choose some kind of functional class that can approximate any function. In, in the traditional statistical learning, you take a linear function, as I said, or maybe you're gonna take a polynomial. And the, the SVM support vector machine, uh, if, you, if you interpret the support vector machine by the kind of framework I'm talking about here, um, you're really, they're taking a kernel of example, you're taking a Gaussian. Mathematically, you can prove that this one can be written as an inner product as a high dimensional Hilbert space. So the phi x and phi y, there's a phi implicitly, there's a hidden, this uh, function we call a phi, we call a feature extraction functions. That would be the function that can be used for, for, for do the classification. Deep neural network is the kind of example I showed you before. And they were linear activation, linear activation, that is sort of, uh, Kind of a neural network. Now the question that uh, you know when you say you know how, you know one of the first questions that is this a functional class has the has the capacity to do a good job or not? This is called a representation power. In mathematical uh, terminology, is an approximation there. You imagine yourself this uh, f or phi this feature might be some kind of continuous function on your data set. Now, can you use your model to approximate as much as, as close as you want? In a polynomial, you know, in mathematics, you call the worst trough theorem. They say for any continuous function, you can approximate it by polynomials. And uh, for, for the kernel method, if it is universal kernel, uh, you know, kernel, it, it also says that you can approximate it by your kernel. And if you do the kernel right. Now, the question is that, uh, can you say something is about the neural network? If uh, can any function be written, can be approximated, this is what called a shallow neural network. And uh, to approximate as close as you can, as you wish. Now there's been an interesting question that on the which condition uh, this, uh, you know, this approximability can be achieved. You, you, that's how you have to choose your activation function appropriately. Interesting thing is that if you take the sigma to be a, a polynomial, like a polynomial degree five, for example, and uh, this will be remain a polynomial degree five in any dimension. There's no way you cannot do the approximation. So polynomial will not be a good activation function. It's, it cannot be, but it turns out that the mathematical question we ask ourselves is that on the which condition this is true, it turns out as long as sigma is not a polynomial, you always have very rich functional class. The representation power will be, uh, as a, uh, will be good, uh, you know. And this is a quite an interesting uh, 
mathematical results. So now these days, so why, why people use ReLU, you know, and uh, sigmoid or all that, but maybe that's for other consideration, but for approximation representation power, you have lots of choices and you can make. And uh, one of the things people say in the machine learning language, wow, they, one of the keywords uh, in the machine learning is the non-linearity. I would say it's a non-polynomial non-linearity. You, you actually want to get out of the polynomial region. So why the polynomial is not good? Well, you know, this, this, this is what they call the curse of dimensionality. If you take a polynomial, a piecewise polynomial, you know, that if the data is in the dimension D, uh, the example I show you these like three million dimension. So the, one of the, the, the early, uh, early uh, uh, work um, um, in the 90s, you can actually prove that uh, take any reasonable function with certain regularity, you can approximate, uh, say this L2 with n neurons, let's say, to the end to the negative half. If you do piecewise polynomial finite element, I'm gonna show you later. It's a one over D or two over D, D is the dimension. If D is a uh, three million, so if N is large, if N is, uh, uh, for example, in the number four, if N is a 10 to, uh, is a one million, so uh, the, the approximating would be, 10 to the minus three. But here, if you take a D for the three million, A for the million, it doesn't really do you anything. So it's very close to one. So this is what they call the curse of dimensionality. And uh, in machine learning, in neural network, somehow many people believe, and uh, this is a, H may also somehow give the theoretical evidence, neural network function doesn't suffer much of the curse of the majority. Actually, I, I, together with my, my poster, Jonathan Siegel, we have been working on this problem in the last few years. For example, if you raise it, we, we can actually have a more refined estimate of like a number five, so that it, you, you, you can really uh, identify the right functional class that give you this kind of uh, dimension kind of, uh, I wouldn't call it independent, but it's kind of, you know, there's an exponent in this, uh, convergence rate, it does not deteriorate very much. There's a negative half right there, which is independent of the dimension. That is, uh, people would believe that uh, deep learning would, would be able to handle high dimensional problem more efficiently than the classical method for based on polynomial, piecewise polynomial. For that, I'm going to bring your, your attention about the, the most popular deep neural network is the real deep neural network which is the example I showed you hiring somebody with the salary and all that. And if you think about that, a functional class, if you print the things, this is a piecewise linear function in this crazy piecewise kind of region, which is kind of polygons. In each one of these polygons, they are just a simple linear function, but there are lots of them. And this, the reason I'm getting into this business is that I have been working on the America BDE in the last 40 years or 30 some years. In that case, you given some kind of a grid, you're talking about a piecewise linear function. You have a grid, you're talking about in 2D, you have triangles. You do, you put a piecewise linear function. This is a visualization in a piecewise linear function. Now, uh, the first question I was interested in this business that how these things are related. This is a piecewise linear function. You put some more kind of re-triangulated these uh, polygons. You can see that uh, piecewise linear function is actually a special kind of uh, linear finite element. But it's actually the, contra the, the opposite is also true. For any linear function, as long as the, the level is, as long as the network is deep enough, it, it turns out uh, as a functional class, the real deep neural network is identical as the set of linear finite element. So this is what I got excited because, I, because I, I worked on finite element for 30 some years and the way I know a few things about it. And I, so one of the things I look at is that, okay, you have the same functional class. You put them together, you have this, uh, all the jungles are the same jungle. Now, if you take a one of them, this is the most interesting property we recently proved that, uh, wait a minute, yeah, with Jonathan Siegel, oh, I don't have the reference here. 
And if you take uh, the neural network, if you take uh, n neurons, uh, even though they are functional class, but they have totally different structures. The approximation problem, one is dependent on the dimension. The other one is, is independent of dimension. If you assume the function to be approximate is sufficiently regular. So this is a kind of remarkable that, uh, 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 have this remarkable property. Uh, the, the, uh, of the, 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 the approximation property. So this is the, uh, the I'm talking about, I, I talk about the linear model, a long linear model, and uh, uh, um, um, so in general, but now let's see how we're gonna actually do that in practice. Suppose this is the, I'm gonna, suppose the data is a, is a, you know, usually the image comes in as high dimensional, but you wanna do some kind of feature extraction. Let's say, I just want to say you, you have some kind of a, what they call domain, dimension reduction, some, some kind of simple plot. So you, you can see, if you see the things in the right side, you know it's Obama. You know, you can do the, you know, some kind of extraction. You can see, uh, we we'll, we'll like to work on the things on the right side which is a lower dimensional thing. It's kind of a very feature ex extraction. But how do you actually extract the feature? There's something called a convolution, which is to be done in the image process. If you take this image, for example, you basically you take the, you pick a point, which is they call X, I, J, you put the neighbor, you take some linear combination of it, you add them together. This is all the formula. Uh, this is all the formula here. And they, let me just give you this example. For example, you have this uh, plot here. In this case, uh, you can think about uh, take the negative one, zero, negative one. You take the final difference between the neighboring point. If the pixel value jumps, you can see the, the vertical direction line can be detected. And uh, um, this is going to detect the vertical line. You can also do the, 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 the diagonal line and uh, um, but if I do this uh, more kind of a symmetric uh, kind of Laplacian type of kind of kernel, you can get all this, uh, you can get this uh, edges in different directions. Let's apply this to, to these images. So if you do these things, you can get some kind of, uh, you, you get some kind of image, some kind of edges uh, effect, you, you see that. But, uh, but when you do the, the relook can enhance it. Well, what do I mean by that? If it's below certain threshold, I just drop it. If it's above certain threshold, I amplify it. So you can make these things uh, and they, to be more visible, to be the, the features more, more, more prominent. And you can suppose even, even do some average. So basically this is a kernel operation, which you can somehow extract the, the feature and uh, and how we're going to understand mathematics, what do we do? So one of the paper we've written is that we assume that uh, you have some kind of, uh, the, the, the right hand side, is, this is G and the U. It's kind of related by this kind of linear system equation. And, um, and um, <clears throat> so basically we want to somehow using the data yeah, again, we, this is our mathematical understanding of the this, uh, for example, convolution and neural network I'm talking about. So you give your a, 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 the data, and I'm going to assume that I'm going to find this a such that I find this more work. This, this u somehow is uh, is uh, is like a, a lower dimensional kind of things, and it's very simple. And you use the data to find the a. And then the, the next question, the how do you solve this uh, number nine? This is uh, uh, the iterative method. And uh, how do you solve the linear system equation is my actual specialty. So my own argument is that uh, I have this mathematical model. So you have very complicated data. Then I want to find something which is, you know, I have a long linear model such that I can get this, uh, this thing is a much more lower dimensional feature is more transparent the feature. I can use the logistic logistic regression SVM to do the job. 
So the way to do it is that I'm gonna solve this equation number nine. So this brings me to something I'm working on. I have been working on this, you know, the for example, this precondition which you've been mentioned in the introduction is all about solving linear system equations. If you solve linear system equation, how do you solve the efficient? But this is the, the one of the major work when you do the scientific computing. And uh, so it is a, Mostly it's because it's expensive. You, if you do the Gauss elimination method, the fastest computer in the world right now is for, for Gaku, I think in Japan. And you got a 400 petal flops. If you do the Gauss elimination, if uh, uh, you solve this uh, general dense matrix, if you take one million, it takes about one second, you know, 10 million, you get a half an hour, you know, 100 million. And uh, 11 days, if it's a one billion, you get a, you take the 30 years. It takes forever to, 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 so solving the system equation is not easy. But the way to do it right now, the kind of, what I've been working on is uh, you can use an iterative method. Let's just use this gradient descent method, which is being used in machine learning to illustrate my idea. So solving a linear system equation for those of you who study linear algebra, it's going to be equivalent to the, you know, to the 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 the, um, the minimize this quadratic form, and if you do gradient descent method again, you take the negative direction. That's pretty much what I would call the Richardson iteration, and uh, you do a precondition of scaling. You take the diagonal inverse, what we call a dimp Jacobi. This Adam method in practice is kind of uh, related to this. Now you can prove that this. Uh, things converge and all that. But the interesting thing is that uh, it behaves in very interesting way in practice. Let me give an illustration of this, uh, my favorite example. You take a three by three matrix, which is a singular. You take a perturbation so that it makes it nearly singular. So you want to iterate by the gradient descent method or Jacobi method. You, when epsilon equal to one, which is, a, which is uh, you, you, you make the stopping criteria with uh, 10 to the minus eight, the residual. When epsilon equal to one, you need a 37 iteration. When epsilon getting smaller, you get more and more singular. You, you, do, you, you do all these things. And uh, so it turns out it's more and more singular. It takes more and more iteration. This is reminiscent for training algorithm. If you train a neural network, it takes weeks. It takes really a lot of iterations, a lot of, uh, uh, iteration to converge because you have lots of data, the, the lots of singularity there. The interesting uh, case in this example is if you take epsilon equal to zero, uh, if you take the epsilon equal to zero, I'm going to, uh, if you start no need to be a linear algebra, if the, my right hand side is a range of this singular matrix, you still have solutions. And uh, it turns out if you do this case, it's uh, all of a sudden it becomes a significant, it's just a day and night difference. Somehow the singular matrix is actually uh, do better. And um, uh, well, uh, I'm going to use this example because in, in this deep learning model, this over parameterization is the technique all these uh, machine learning CN, this the transformers have uh, billions of parameters. There's a four by four problem. I can make it to a four, uh, three by three, I can make it a four by four. You can write this uh, three vector, um, this P is this in the kernel one, one, one. If I write this uh, as, um, as a kind of uh, expansion by, you know, by this four vectors, you can transform the original system, three by three system to a four by four system, which is a singular. And now you want to use the Jacobi method for this one. If you do the Jacobi system here, it turns out that now the convergence is just remarkably, remarkably better. It's just a very robust and convergence, very fast. Only parameterization is very well understood in the kind of things that I work on. And the over parameterization in machine learning is a very technique, very major technique, I, which I'm going to, my belief is that um, you know, over parameterization helps you train faster. But anyway, that's the other, I'm going to come 
back to this question later. But uh, in, in any case, uh, and uh, this one tells you that uh, main, the, the main message here is that this P vector is a one dimensional, it's a very special guy. You have this, uh, if you think about uh, the, the multi scaling things, you have this three by three matrix, you got a one by one matrix. So the algorithm I mentioned before, you can think about a multi level method. And uh, <clears throat> so, but, uh, but in practice, you know, the multi scale is the main key in machine learning, in my opinion. And you want to, uh, you have, for example, this is uh, the image. If you have a different resolution, you get a different kind of uh, image, but you basically want to extract your features through this uh, different scale. That's actually precisely what the convolutional neuron work is doing. So, uh, but I, before I introduce these things, uh, these things which I worked for this 30 some years, for example, you solve the, the you know, deformation of elastic material, and it amounts to some kind of partial differential equation. If you do it discreetly, it looks like this uh, you know, kernel I showed you earlier, which uh, convolution with this uh, U is the displacement. You solve this equation. For this equation, if you put the multi gradient into the business, you solve this, not only the original equation, we will, I put all these cost grid things in there, multi-scale together. You do a multi-scale with this is a, what we call the 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 a multi grid method, which I worked on this for like thirty some years. If you do these things, the the convergence is going to be remarkable. If you take the solve the original problem, you need a 50, 60 iteration for four by four. If you increase these things, this the you know the the, the gradient descent method or, or the traditional method, it takes uh, takes forever. But the the multi grid method is just uh, extremely much, much, much faster. And if you come back to this, uh, this uh, if you use the uh, Gauss elimination, if you do multi grid to compare, you know, you need a, uh, you know, maybe if you take a one million, even I talking about multi grid on my laptop, one core, if you take one million, you only a quarter of a second. This is a linear mass, so 2.5 second. For one, hundred, one billion, I only needed 250 seconds. And, uh, but this one takes uh, years and it really is day and night different. And uh, this is, again, this is the, for example, I use this, um, it's been mentioned in the introduction. We actually, uh, we'll have this algorithm, you know, get, have the OE report to the, the US Congress. And it shows that we actually have the fundamental algorithm, which is, uh, a few order of magnitude faster than the best method in the DOE because of this multi grid technology. Now, now, the question I'm just trying to say the multi grid for solving differential, partial differential equation, like a modern linear elasticity, it's very powerful. And uh, now the question can the power of a multi grid be transformed into a convolutional neural network? I think the convolutional neural network, if you, you have play with, you do the pull in all that is uh, some kind of multi grid method. And, um, and I'm going to try to do that right now. And again, uh, so if you solve the partial differential equation I showed you earlier, so now I'm going to see the feature extraction based on my model here is to really solve an equation like 15. So how do we do that? We basically, if you use the geometric multi grid method to solve 14, I'm also, Going to use a multi grid solve for 15. So, so, so I'm going to write down this uh, the, in this uh, in this uh, screen. Uh, if you do, if you remove the things in red, okay, uh, that's the outer part. That's a very classical multi grid method. So right now, when I teach a, a machine learning method, I ask my student or or the right um, a code for multi-grid, then you just write a minor modification of the code. You get a, what I call MGNet is just a special convolutional neural network. And, they, and this is really, the, the structure is the same as multi-grid. And they, uh, I, it is a simpler structure with very few parameters to tune. It turns out it's quite, uh, 
it's also quite a, it's very accurate. It's pretty robust, actually. We actually did the comparison. We, we, we tried the many the data, given the same sort of uh, trick you play, there's all kinds of different tricks you play. We compare with this uh, best method out there for the given set of techniques. We actually have fewer parameter and uh, with a better accuracy. And uh, this is for your sidebar 10, we can get a 2% better. And this one is uh, it's competitive with image net, but, uh, and, uh, but you, you get a very, very good, uh, uh, it's actually slightly better, like 1%, but, uh, but anyway, the, um, uh, but this is based on the mathematics. And the MGNet is a special case of a CNN. This is a two milestone in this development of a convolutional neural network. This is, uh, this is uh, Yann Kong and uh, the Geoffrey Hinton. And uh, uh, they have different structures, but again, uh, they are the one who really I made a fundamental contribution in the development of a CNN. And, um, but what I want to show is that uh, another thing is called a resonant residual network. If you, this is a Kai Ming He's paper. And um, uh, the, it is uh, considered to be quite a, a milestone in the de development of, um, you know, convolutional neural network. And uh, it turns out mathematically, we do not have the same feature variable, but uh, the, 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 their method is actually residual. This uh, Kamin Hurst residual. For us, is this U, and this are the feature variable. It turns out that we have experiments to show is that uh, to use the U as a feature variable is actually works uh, better, at least uh, as competitive as before. But, but uh, anyway, these are the mathematics and uh, it's mathematically motivated the things. Uh, I've, anyway, what I say to you is the most convolutional neural network, or at least I can convert a multi grid method, which I know very well, into a convolutional neural network with a com compar compar com you know, com comparable and uh, competitiveness. And uh, into something kind of, kind of MG net, and which works quite well. The annoying thing is that it's not working. I would think it should be working much better, but we can only do uh, slightly better. Something I'm, I, I, I still believe there's lots of room for improvement. But I, I'm going to uh, give some example of uh, of this uh, machine learning things. Um, one of these is this is something I did with my students. I don't know if for those of you from the audience, if you watch your movies for Chinese kind of medication, if a Chinese doctor put the hand in the in the in a woman, you know, the hand to to, to read the pulse, and they, somehow the, the 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 Chinese doctor claims that by reading the pulse, the feeling of the pulse, you can tell if the person is pregnant or not. So we actually collaborate with a group of people in Peking University to actually go collect the data. And uh, it turns out actually, at least for the data, we will collect about 4,000 people. And uh, we can actually tell the, you know, in this binary classification problem is the AUC quantitative and the error under the curve is anyway, it's pretty, pretty good. You get a near 90% of performance. We use MGNet. So if you use Resonate, you, you need a 200 some thousand parameter. If you use MGNet, we can get only three some thousand parameter. You get a, the AUC is like a 91%. But so support vector machine and the logistic regression, and they are, they are somehow they, they, they are in the 70%. As you can see, that uh, this is just a, a uh, yeah. Uh, based on the data we collected, it's kind of a fun problem to try. But uh, you know, the, the, there are lots of great applications with AI. I just want to, to so the auto driving, for example, I, I myself are driving a, a Tesla these days, but I, and they, uh, it's amazing actually, it works quite well. If you think about uh, Tesla has eight cameras. The, the Tesla, you, you, every moment you collect uh, eight, uh, images. 
And uh, if you make it uh, simplistically speaking, you just have to decide when you drive the car. You either keep the same speed, the same direction, no changes, or you speed it up, or you slow it down, or you make a left turn or make a right turn. It's five classification. So you want to classify eight images, collection eight images into five different classes. And uh, it is an image classification problem. And, uh, but of course they use uh, lots of other technology. Uh, the, 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 the reinforcement learning in particular, but it works uh, pretty well based on my own experience driving the car. And they, but there's other application, for example, this is a, this actually reported very recently. Uh, the, the, this uh, this uh, protein structure prediction, and uh, this AI developer by the DeepMind, they can predict the protein 3D structure, you know, very accurate. It's as accurate as from the experiment, where it's competitive, it's, it's, it's considered to be very remarkable. Um, even more recently, <laughs> half a code, even this month, they reported that uh, they're doing this, uh, you know, they have developed this uh, system to write the program, alpha code, write code, you know, we write code all the time. Somehow uh, you have a competition uh, and uh, it, this uh, AI system seems to write a better code than almost half of the participants. That, that's amazing, it's, it's very hard to believe, but that's what they reported. And uh, so uh, AI for scientific computing is pretty, popular field these days. For example, if you actually learning the algorithm, for example, we did a simple problem, if you take the process media flow or stuff, you can you can easily achieve. If you don't care about training data, it's the test. If you train offline, is you know, you get more than two order of magnitude or faster. This one takes, uh, I don't know, six, some hundred thousand for one solve, but this takes less than one second. And, uh, Anyway, I'm gonna just uh, draw some, uh, make some some comments and remarks uh, before I finish. I have uh, some, maybe just a personal opinion. It's very much biased, I guess, where, because of my computer science friend may, may not agree with me. And uh, I do have strong belief what, what I'm gonna say. So, uh, I think we can have a reasonable good mathematical understanding of deep learning. Not everything, but a lot of component. I believe there's a much room for improvement for 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 for, for architecture like a CNN and the transformer these days. And the training algorithm, I, I hope, should be made faster and more accurate, especially by multi grid method. And I don't think we need that many parameters. And uh, now you have a uh, billions of parameters. Uh, and uh, but the question from mathematics we understand to reality is not easy. And uh, this is the, the really the first time in my career we find it's very difficult to compete with people from company. They have a lot of people, especially computing power is tremendous. And uh, so um, anyway, so the the more specific I want to make some comments that first of all this. Uh, this, for example, the most popular ReLU DNA is actually the same as finite element methods, which I've been working on. The convolutional neural network is more or less like a multi-grid method. And uh, you know, I know quite, you know, I have quite a bit of experience in this finite element and multi-grid. I was hoping to turn into this, uh, my understanding into this, uh, into the design of the, the deep learning, the deep learning, you know, the main things about the model, for example, CNN and transformer, one of the main things is they use the multi-scale structures. The question is that do you use the multi-structure the optimal way? And this depends on the choice of activation function, training algorithm, and also something called the spectral bios, which, you know, recently I was finished a paper on, the, which is different from what the, the, the community knows. And the structure of the model and the, and all that, and um, you have to design the multi-grid, the, the multi-scale way in a very complementary, optimal way. For me, I see there's a lot of room for improvement. But my computer science friends would uh, disagree with me. This has been done. Well, transformer now these days people are quite uh, active on that. But uh, 
But anyway, there's a lot of uh, you know, now the question though, we believe that, you know. You know, the, the, the model capacity, my understanding, most of the deep learning model has a sufficient representation power. And uh, but you have lots of parameter, I believe, is because you make it easier to join. It's like the, my three by three, four by four example is kind of illustration. The approximation theorem, Jonathan and I have written quite many, but I believe we, we understood the shallow neural network quite well these days. The deeper neural network requires more research. Is deeper the better? And the, all that kind of question. And the training algorithm is the key, I think. And uh, I think it's the key to everything. You, you know, they, is, we are solving a highly long convex optimization problem. And, uh, and uh, you know, you, you need the, the right regulation and all that. And, but usually it takes, a, it is the training algorithm takes a, a lot of resources. I'm hoping that uh, we use a multi-grid technique to speed it up. We, 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 we see some progress, but uh, still a long way to go. And uh, machine learning for computers, scientific computing is a very active research field right now. But uh, the, all these state of art is have very low accuracy. And uh, you know, we recently written, written a paper to look at the theoretical and all that. And, um, um, but uh, we find out that for typical training algorithm for image classification, such as stochastic gradient descent or Adam as a, in my opinion, they are not good. They are not, they should be replaced by something else. But uh, we're working on that. And um, so I just uh, bring us some reference here, you know, you have, uh, the young Cohen, Benjo, the Hinton, the other leading person, they wrote a paper, Deep Learning of you know, Nature. Benjo and his colleague, Gurfer, has a, this book. I actually recently been teaching some course at Penn State. And uh, I proposed this course last year, and now it's uh, officially listed as Penn State course of Mass 452. It's been offered this semester. And uh, we are trying to, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, the idea I mentioned in this class so will be somehow be taught in this class. And uh, I taught that in the summer, this semester is teaching by Dr. Ching Guo Hong. And he told me there's a 85 enrollment of, of the students, of people. There's a quite a bit of demand from our students who want to learn more about uh, deep learning and uh, the mathematical aspect of it. Hopefully this, uh, lecture give you some idea of the kind of mathematics I'm thinking. I, I'm going to stop here. Uh, thank you very much for your, for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Ju. Um, so while you start uh, putting your questions, I already see one question there in, in the questions and answers. Uh, I'll be uh, reading these uh, questions. Um, okay, so I have my own, but I, Questions started appearing, so I'm gonna use the ones from the participants first. Um, so the first question says, thank you for a great talk. May I have one question? Any comment on the connection between finite element methods and graph neural networks, and also between AMG and GNN, as opposed to the fully connected MLP, the permutation invariance of GNN, seems a much closer fit for FEM theory? Yeah, that's a very, very good question. I actually, um, I, in some of my earlier talks, it's a subject I really want to work on. And uh, the convolutional neural network is for image. If you think about pixel structures, it's what I call a regular grid. It's a regular graph. Is what we call it, you can use geometric multigrid to solve, uh, to do the convolutional neural network. Now, if you have an unstructured grid in finite element method, the geometric multigrid uh, cannot be applied so easily. So we have this, uh, I worked this for so many years, something called it as the, the question just mentioned that is algebraic multigrid method. You identify algebraically this, multi-level structure in this graph or grid. And the unstructured grid, it is best understood in the graph theorem. You have the nodes and the connection, what you say is all this stuff. You need the cause in the graph. It is always my belief, which I 
Unfortunately, I don't, I don't have a good collaborator. I have, I'll be busy with other things. I do believe the algebraic multigrade is a natural tool. I don't know if this has been done or not. I've been advocating them in my talk in the last couple, three years, couple of years. And uh, for, for the guy, the person who asking that question, please write me an email if you want to work together. And I, I, I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, I, I really think uh, the kind of idea break multigrade we developed in the last 20 some years. I wrote a, a review article in Actually America recently with uh, my colleague Ludmila Zikatanov. We actually, in our department, we have quite a, you know, some good expertise in multigrade technology. Yes, uh, it is my belief, and uh, you know, algebraic multigrid, which is developed for the unstructured finite element method, can be used for graph uh, neural network. And um, the connection between deep learning and the finite element method is everywhere. And this is one of the examples. Thank you very much for the question. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Abai. So uh, thank you for a stimulating talk. My question is in a slightly different direction. Are methods for differential geometry currently used to find, for example, surfaces that separate sets of points? In such an approach, one would replace the Euclidean space in which data points live on a manifold with an appropriately chosen metric. This would be in a similar spirit as finite elements to go beyond polynomial approximations. Very good question, thank you. And uh, the, um, the, the piecewise polynomial neural network, like a Relu neural network, is, is built a functional class that uh, would find that kind of a low dimensional manifold in some sense. The word metric <laughs> is the most critical word. Uh, thank you for bringing that one. What kind of a metric should be used? For example, you take an image, if we translate the image to the right, it's the same image. But uh, if you take a Euclidean metric, you get a totally with a huge distance. In some sense, machine learning is the length of metric. You have to, for example, support a vector machine, which has, I put the things in the middle. What do you mean in the middle? It's a distance between the, 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 the bug, the other distance for the cat. Is this a distance, it's a metric is the whole thing, I think. And uh, I think the, 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 uh, the, the finite element, uh, the way I see is that it, uh, it's a functional class. And also the way the technology, which is associated with finite multigrid method, has a lot of resemblance with, uh, with, with this deep learning technique. Even there's the manifold learning, all that sort of things, and even though they may sound differently, but the main mathematical the, the questions seem probably very closely related. And thank you very much for the question. I don't know if I answer your question. Um, so the next question is, uh, can multigrid be used to solve linear systems in distributed training? But the distributed training, you know, maybe you want to federal training, or whatever you call it. So, uh, so you, uh, when you say distributed training, you put this computer in different processes and collect them together. I, I, I suppose that's what it means. But uh, this is what we're talking about parallelization. One of my most popular methods is called the method of subsequent correction. I was actually had a good, interesting conversation with this uh, inventor of the federal training in Kaust a few months ago. And the, 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 uh, the, the, the distributed training, if I understood it correctly, the parallel training or federal training is uh, what I call, uh, you want to divide and concur you, 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 the, this uh, process, somehow the, the, the changing process in a different kind of distributing different process or things, how you collect, collect them together. And the multi-grid method, actually the way I want you to you're talking to some of this BPX, for example, the multi-grid method, uh, it is a more se sequential method. BPX is a parallel version of the traditional V-cycle, W-cycle method. This is what, what, one of the main things in my PhD thesis. And the, the answer in principle is yes. And you can do a parallelization of your training, at least for the PDE or linear system equation in a parallel fashion and uh, in a distributed way. 
And uh, there are all many different kind of techniques, like the BPX, for example, is one of them. Oh, yeah, you know, in my paper, which uh, which I wrote in the Science Review, nineteen ninety two, I believe, is in the, I call it parallel subspace corrections. Thank you for the question. I hope we are, uh, if I hope I understood your question correctly. Thank you. The next question. Uh, very nice presentation. Any comments on transfer learning? <laughs> transfer learning is. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I think that's the. Um, um, something I am <laughs> keenly interested. Um, one of the mystery of uh, <clears throat> of, um, of for example, you have a lot of parameters these days. The transfer learning, you have this. Uh, I think ultimately, in the end, uh, our AI system will be very big uh, to be able to do multitask. These days, the AI says you go to one thing, you do this and do that. <laughs> And our brain can do multitask. Transfer learning is certainly, in the end, <laughs> you have to be, it's necessary. And also that uh, image classification, these days they do all the, they, they train the things uh, in, the, uh, in the right, um, uh, in the existing data. The transfer learning is important uh, for me is the following reason. You have too many parameters. You don't, you have so many parameters, but you have very few data. You have billions of parameters, but you, only, you can only have a few million, maybe hundreds, like depending on Google, maybe have lots of data, but you still, your data cannot be as many as the parameters. Come, come on, please. If, you, if a parameter is more than the data, it's very easy to have overfitting. The only way to get in the right direction to try the, solve the minimization problem that has go to generalization, you really have to use a lot of data. Transfer learning, you have some other data, train some that's variable. And mathematically, it makes sense. You, 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 you have to, too many primary data, data, lots of primary, mathematically, you are supposed to need to overfit it. The only way to, this is only my, <laughs> my personal opinion. I'm not, they have a different way of explaining this. The only way for me to think about to bring them into the right direction of the parameters is to, you know, if you have transfer learning some other things, you, you, you get to the right direction. And also you have to bring a lot of regularization in the things. If you have parameter more than the data, you have to, either increase the, the, the data or you have to bring a lot of regularization to reduce the dependence, the independence of the data, the parameter you have. There's no other way. Otherwise the mathematics would make sense, would not make sense. That's my, 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 my limited view on this top to, to answer your question. But, uh, but ultimately, uh, hopefully in the end, the AI system is as smart as a human being. In that case, uh, different application. You are, I don't know how many billions of uh, neurons in our head here. So we got a lot of training from different places. It, it has to be transfer learning if you want to do the human intelligence uh, somehow in the artificial intelligence. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next question. Is the following correct? The deep learning process begins with an evaluation of an image and assigning numerical values to individual pixels and groups of pixels. Uh, can you repeat the question? <laughs> Sorry. So I think yes. I kind of uh, repeat the question. You basically, you, uh, you image is a bunch of pixels. It's a long vectors. And uh, the, the label, you put the image, you say, this is a cat. And uh, so the label is basically, that is treated as a, a point in the high dimension of Euclidean uh, space. And uh, then you put the image on it. That will be the training, uh, put the, the label on it. That will be the training data. Excuse me, what is the question again? Sorry. Uh, so the question was if the statement was correct, the deep learning process begins with an evaluation of an image and assigning numerical values to individual pixels and groups of pixels. It's not an individual pixel. You assign the numeric value. I think the first of all, you the numeric process that you work with uh, 
It's a convolutional neural network. You work on the pixel and its neighborhood used by the convolution to do the feature extractions. Would you, you train the numerical variety, you don't assign. You only assign the, the labor <laughs> in the, but of course it's the, it's the training process that assigns that. The pooling, for example, the pooling is that you, uh, you have taken a neighbor of a, a collection of pixel, you, you, you put it into one pixel. So in the training process, you would assign some value there after the pooling. I don't know if I, <laughs> the answer is, uh, is kind of yes, but not, uh, it's, it's done by the, by the process, the training process. Thank you. The next question is, um... Can deep learning substitute FEM to solve partial differential equations one day? <laughs> uh, thank you for the question. I've been you know, thinking about this. But I don't know. <laughs> one day, uh, <clears throat> as, um, uh, the main challenge right now is that um, uh, I actually made the comments that, uh, somehow. The answer is no, no, uh, probably not even in the you know, uh, near future. The reason is the following that um, it depends on what do you mean by this. Okay. If you solve one single partial differential equation, if I do a neural network to do it, and then you have to solve this alone in your problem, doing all this crazy, I'm sorry, <laughs> optimization algorithm. But I can tell you right now, the existing technology, you, 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 the solution you get is a very low accuracy. It doesn't really converge mathematically. And I recently wrote some paper with my student postdoc. We can actually make that somatotically convergent, but it's a, with a huge cost. So if you solve one single equation, uh, I do not think, uh, it depends how uh, complicated the problem is, but I, I still say that, uh, if you can use finite element to solve a finite difference, I, I don't think we should use machine learning. That's my personal opinion. But if you want to use really machine learning, for example, you solve a whole bunch of equations. Next time, my new data, for example, you say this, uh, this, uh, um, this, uh, you know, this, this aerodynamics, you solve, I don't know, the, the, the Mach number. The Mach number is supersonic, uh, supersonic, you solve a whole bunch of Mach. Now, next time I have a different Mach number. Because you have a training data from all other Mach number, which is probably, I probably use uh, three weeks in my supercomputer to train it. But the next time you, you, you invite it, if you train the network, and then you can do it in a matter of seconds. So in the future, I think, well, you know, if you were doing a numerical simulation, you do, we only solve a few equations, frankly. <laughs> you solve a Navier-Stokes, a Maxwell equation, elasticity, multi-physics, all that. Suppose in the future, somehow we collect all this uh, computation which you accumulated from all over the world, a different group of people. You have all this training data there. The next computation is not a brand new computation. It's a small perturbation of the computation done in the past. If that day arrives, I will just train the whole things. And uh, now I'm not gonna use finite element anymore because uh, if, you, if the new problem we're trying to solve is pretty similar to all the things being solved in the past, somehow if some kind of a you know, capable person, a group of people, a big company, somehow to collect all these things together, I believe that should be the future. I think that when that day arrives, Find out the animal method, you don't need that. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> and, uh, Thank you. Um, next question. Thank you very much for a great talk. The comparison of MGNet is mainly with image classification. Do you think this can be extended to other vision problems such as object detection and image segmentation? Thank you. Uh, anything which related to image, I believe, image segmentation, actually you, most of the, the main technology is called UNET. And the, actually the multi-view method I'm using right now, the image that will only use one leg 
of the multigrade. You should actually, you just go cosine and cosine and cosine and you stop there, which I believe the, 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 it should not be the way to do it. CNA and somehow just stop it there. And then you really have to go back. Instead of a V cycle, you go down the slash cycle to equal to V. Okay, there's machine learning people call U, not the U and V. But, uh, so the U cycle is the V cycle and the uh, segmentation certainly uh, is already doing that somehow. Is the V cycle or U, U net. And uh, anything with respect to image, and even the language NLP, for example, you do trans, uh, for example, you do voice recognition. Voice recognition is a curve, you, you have a sound curve. If you turn the curve into words, <laughs> it's a, it's a one-dimensional curve, even though they look a little bit crazy, but, uh, but it's still, it's, you do have an image and uh, which uh, the multi technology should apply. I really strongly believe that. And thanks for the question. <laughs> but, uh, but again, um, you believe it, but you're talking to computer scientists, okay, show me how much improvement. <laughs> but I need a 1,000 1, 1, 1, GPU, you know, but I only got eight. And, uh, but anyway, they, uh, uh, I think the, the mathematics is clear to me, I believe. And uh, I do not believe, uh, I'm sure most people disagree to me. CNA is done correctly. And uh, it's, um, maybe I shouldn't say that. It could be done better, all right. Then, uh, but again, uh, we're just making very slow progress on that. Thank you. Thank you. Next question says, uh, to solve partial differential equations, is DNN a mesh-free method? <laughs> DNN, I call it a pointless mess. <laughs> Not only messy free, also point free. There's, a, there's a no geometrical quantity. It's definitely the meshless. If you're talking about the, the other mesh method, you actually have uh, particles. It's a party, particle less method. But I pointless. Wow, well, that means something different. But it is definitely the mesh free method. Yes, indeed. It actually has no vertices, there's no particles. It's a totally geometric free. There's a on the line and grid. But if you're talking about a meshless, actually, this is just a terminology people use. Mesh is a, a special word of a graph. When you talk about particles in meshless, I actually have a strong uh, disagreement with my friends who work on this. I call a meshless, it has more mesh than mesh method. Why? Because you take a vertex, it takes the particle. When you interact with, with your neighbor, you have to, right? Graphically speaking, if you do the graphic language, you create the edge. <laughs> so I actually showed to some of my colleagues, if I actually create the graph to the, you have lots of more meshes than actually finite element mesh. So it's just a way of thinking, a way of language. But, uh, but this method, you don't even have particles, but uh, there's underlying meshes, which I showed you earlier, which looks kind of crazy. But uh, at least you don't start from the mesh. Yes, it is meshless. Thank you. The next question says, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, how do you think multigrid method can be applied to transformer? The transformer, that's a <laughs> tra transformer. When I first look at the transformer, I, I consider some kind of two level method. They, 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 they crop the image into several pieces. Then I call it like a domain decomposition. But later on, they bring the CNA and to use them together. Okay, so to answer your question, it's a, this is a very good question, which I think a lot of these days. And the multigrid, you basically, multigrid, the main idea of multigrid, you do a global dependency kind of operation into a sequence of a local one. What, what, what I call the, multi-level greedy algorithm. So when you say a convolution in CNN, you, you, you do a local operation. You do, a, you, do, you do only do your neighbor, but transformer, they do the global operation, what they call attention, which is a, a dense matrix operations. And uh, as, as I said earlier, that it, it all has to do how you train these things. 
if you have enough smart people <laughs> and a lot of computer power, size will certainly takes care of the global dependency better than CNN because you're using dense matrix operations. Now the question is that the bottom, how are you going to train this damn thing? I'm sorry, <laughs> you have to train this thing. But somehow they, they have all the smart people figure out and they, to, but they also trying to combine these two together and all that. And uh, uh, I certainly hope that, uh, especially with image, CNN, well, there's a, these days some people transform is to, to image, but NLP, the other one, they said transform is good. But uh, for image, uh, computer vision stuff, I still think of CNN. Uh, well, well, do a good job. I, I, but, I, but, 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 but it's, it's, uh, I just checked some literature before the talk. <laughs> there's, a, there's a fight between the two. I don't know, there's so many people say, oh, see, it's better. Then you combine these two together, you get some good numbers. And uh, yes, I think that it is all multi-scale metal. And uh, you, you, the question is that, uh, that's why I do the frequency bios, all that kind of things is relevant. And uh, your multi-scale has to complementary to each other. And uh, the pulling, the smoothing, all, all the things has done be you know, in a complementary way, uh, which in my view is not being done in CNN. But again, uh, I have not demonstrated the, 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 the great improvement <laughs> yet. But uh, so I, I, that's only my personal opinion. Thank you for the Thank question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh we are 12 30 and i want to respect people's time but I, I still have five questions that we couldn't get to it today so i encourage people to to email you and, and send you those questions your way because I, it, it seems very interesting that people wants to keep discussing but uh thank you very much so be, to all of you before uh you leave remember that uh there will be a post survey in, immediately in zoom or in your email within the next day so please take a minute to fill this out uh, because it helps us determine how to make these uh, lectures more engaging and more popular. So thank you very much. Um, next week's webinar will be our final lecture this year. Um, and it will be the, on the same time, same link. And it will feature S. Uh, Shyaman Sandar, who is the director of the Center for Socially Responsible Artificial Intelligence at Penn State. Uh, the title of his talk is Importance of Human Agency in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. So, uh, Dr. Zhu, thank you very much again. And uh, for the rest of you, I'll see you next week. Bye. Thanks to everyone. Thank you. <laughs>